normally have a scripture reading at this portion of our um, gathering. And uh, today the topic is about how to read the Bible. So I thought I would give you our big idea first before I read some scriptures. Um, and I'm just grateful for the opportunity to share with you all today. I, um, I was just reflecting on the fact that, uh, I mean, what, we're in this series right now that is meant to just be a, let's get back to the basics of uh, why Sola Church is and why it does what it does. Um, we believe that we're an assembly of God's people, a local expression of God's people called a, a local church, representative of um, the universal church and a reality that has existed uh, from time past, that God's people have gathered, they have assembled, um, they are called by him to be on his mission, um, equipped and empowered by him himself, and uh, um, living in light of, of a story that claims to be the story that interprets all other stories and uh, directs history. And so we've taken these first few weeks of, um, of the year of 2021 to come back to that. And we started with what is the big story? A couple weeks ago, Mark went over that last week, was about our mission statement and why we would have the mission statement that we do. And today is how to read the Bible because it's a foundational document. It is our sacred text. Um, and so the way we approach it uh, and look at it and the significance we give to it shapes how we operate. So today, my big idea for you all is that God gave the scriptures to his family, and I'm saying family, meaning the true nature of his people, the church. God gave the scriptures to us to remind his family who they are and what story they inhabit so they would faithfully play their part in it. And I've spent probably at least 10 years formally studying this topic. I've taught multiple classes on it. I've preached many messages on this very topic. So I promise you that I am not going to try to say everything that can possibly be said about how to read the Bible in the next 20 minutes. Um, if, if, I, if we as leadership place all our eggs in the basket of one-time teaching, uh, then we're destroyed, right? So we are coming back to and being reminded of some of the, the important points of it, but we, are, we say these things many times. We have said them many, many times. We taught, uh, I, I would recommend that you go and uh, watch through or listen through the series we did in, was it 2019? 2020 is both a blip and a, and a decade. Um, I think in 2019, we did a series on how to read the Bible. I'd recommend you go and, and take a look at that uh, for a more robust uh, filling out. I think we've done several classes as well that I think have been recorded and are on our website. Um, I would certainly recommend that. But we're going to come back and be reminded about how the scriptures play a key role, an important part in the life of the church and in our church especially. And then what is it that, that uh, we, we should do with that, really? So... Um, so I want to read several passages, and then I have four talking points to go over with you, and that's pretty much it today. So uh, if you want to know everything I believe about reading the Bible, this isn't all of it. <laughs> There's more, um, but hopefully this kind of gets us like moving in a direction or reminds us of, of some things. So I want to start with uh, some scriptures. We're going to read some scriptures together. First one is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You'll probably recognize most of these passages, and it'll be up on the screen. 2 Timothy 3, actually it's 14 through 17 that I'm going to read, and it says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. The you is Timothy. The one instructing him is his mentor, Paul. Timothy was half Gentile, half Jew. He grew up in the traditions of, uh, of Judaism, and so he was familiar with the sacred writings, the scriptures. In this case, it would have been referring primarily to the Older Testament. Um, but he was familiar with them because his family uh, and his community uh, kept him exposed to it. And so from childhood, he had been acquainted, verse 15, with the sacred writings. And then Paul says, 
These are able to make you wise for salvation, interestingly enough, through faith in Christ Jesus. Did you know you can find Jesus in the Old Testament? (laughs) All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is one of the classic passages that we go to for the significance of scriptures. But I also want to add to that. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. The writer of Hebrews came probably a generation later than this. And some people think he may have crossed over paths with some of the apostles, but probably was writing to a church that had been around for a couple of decades at least who are struggling, um, saying life is hard under this way. (laughs) It'd be so much easier if we could just go back to following the old laws and rules of Judaism. Can we just do that, please? It's so hard. And so he wrote this whole book, a sermon called Hebrews, to help them say, please, no, you are moving from reality to shadow if you do that. And this is how he introduces that. Long ago, At many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. He's referring to scriptures here again. Some of the the words God spoke through the prophets were inscripturated. Verse 2, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he starts right off saying, no, we will not go back to shadow. Because God has spoken most clearly in Jesus. John 5.39, Jesus saying to uh, the people who knew their Bibles the best, who were struggling with who he was, the Pharisees, and were confronting him in his ways. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And Jesus is saying, that's right. But they bear witness about me. And then finally, Luke 24, 18 through 27. I love this, uh, this story. Um, after Jesus' death and resurrection, seems like the disciples are either hiding or dispersing. These two guys are walking on a road to Emmaus. Um, and uh, one of them's name is Cleopas. And uh, Jesus, the risen Jesus, comes and meets them on the road and they don't recognize him. Who knows why? Um, And so Jesus says, what are you guys, why are you so sad? What what are you guys talking about? Why are you sad? And then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb And found it, just as the women had said, empty, but him they did not see. And he said to them, how foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And this is the one where I wish I was a fly on the wall. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, meaning he went back to the beginning, to Genesis, And he worked his way all the way through everything that they had up to that point. He interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Wouldn't that have been an awesome conversation to be in on? And it says later on that when he revealed himself to them and then he took off, 
He revealed himself. They recognized him when he broke the bread. He did the thing. He was like, you know, the thing that, uh, very earthy thing that we're going to do in just a little bit. Um, He broke the bread with them, and then he took off. And when they ran back to Jerusalem to tell all the disciples that were hiding, they said, didn't our hearts burn within us while he was telling us these things? So we want to be people who read scriptures and have our hearts burn within us as we read them because we see God in his story and plan and we're inspired by the hero, Jesus, to walk in his ways by the power of the Spirit and contextualize for today what the Bible is all about. And so that's why I say he gave us these scriptures to remind us who we are and what story we inhabit so that we would faithfully play our part in it. So, four things. First of all, um, is somebody controlling slides back there? I didn't even take the thing. Sorry. Here we go. Okay, read it as, uh, first of all, we want to read the scriptures as divinely collected and inspired works of literature. And what do I mean by that? Divinely collected and inspired works of literature. Okay, so God is the source of these scriptures. That's why we go back to passages like all scripture has been breathed out by God. Everywhere we find the scriptures referring to themselves as having an ultimately divine source, meaning God was the one who thought these up. And then in the same way that um, we use the terminology of inspiration, uh, have you ever heard somebody talk about some piece of, of art that they had and, or, or maybe a, a work, uh, poetic or um, anything really, like something that they did, and then they said, I got my inspiration from X, Y, Z. Like what they mean is it occurred to me in this way. When I, was, when I was doing this and then working on this, this is what kind of fueled me. And so um, inspiration is not something that bypasses the humanity of someone. But there are things that spark things in people. And so when we read that God has inspired scripture, what it means is that God himself is that spark for the people that have written the, the works of, of, of scripture, the different uh, uh, pieces of literature that make up what we call the 66 books of the Bible. So he used, God is its source, therefore all of it together has a great unity and a unifying thread from beginning to end all throughout of it all throughout it but he uses the means of human authors writing in historical contexts using different styles of writing different genres you might call them that were given to us and compiled into whole books so genesis is a whole book exodus is a whole book leviticus is a whole book And so to get the flow of what's going on, you have to read them as whole books. Even the Psalms uh, are small sections, like each one is a song of some sort, right? But they were compiled by someone into a whole collection with unity there um, and movement. So there are historical contexts that these these, uh, books were given in by human authors at specific times in history using specific styles of writing that give us these. And so sometimes we'll talk about the big A author, God, who oversees it all and and has orchestrated it all, and the little A author, whoever the human author was of each section of writing. And sometimes even that human author is on multiple levels. So you might have had David who wrote an individual psalm, But then some other other person, probably a priest or someone else involved in liturgy, compiled all these into the psalms that we have currently with their their different movements. Okay, So big A and little a. And our task always then is to read each one, each section, for what it was at face value in the time it was given to start with, meaning we are always going after the human author's intent as he wrote it to his original audience. We start there, but then we move on because there's a big A author, we move on. So we believe that the divine author also had an intent which incorporates that human author's intent, but he's going somewhere beyond, okay? 
Um, and that's why I have right here this analogy of a mosaic. I love the analogy of a mosaic, right? Because you have all of these tiny little pieces that in and of themselves are works of art. And you can see how in this one especially, I know it's pretty pixely, which pixels themselves are another example. I mean, God laces creation with, you know, all these examples. But it's a little pixely. But can you see how, like, this piece of the mosaic is a huge chunk, right? And this one is a huge chunk. And it has shape and definition and, and color and, and uh, it has shadow. These little ones over here are the same. They have individual shape and definition and color and shadow and, and texture even in this case. Um, but someone has taken all those individual little pieces and they have worked them together in this grand work of art that, that is telling you something in and through what the others are telling you. And so if I was to take this mosaic, I can look at each individual one for what it is, and I should. But I also need to pull it back and look at the unity of all of it and see where whoever took this little bit here is going with the whole thing. It's kind of like in a house. You have a blueprint, right? And there's going to be somebody who comes along and follows normal procedures for building the foundation. You're going to have someone else who's going to come along and frame everything up. You're going to have people who come in and wire it and plumb it. You know, the, the plumbers may not know what the final look of the house is going to be, but you can bet that what they're doing is incorporated into that whole system. And so, um, so you, th this is the way that we are to look at our scriptures as well. Okay? Um, we believe, we look at each uh, bit for what it was at, fa uh, at face value, and I should stop using the word bit, but each book, each book and each work together for what it was at face value in the time it was given, while also believing that the divine author has an intent uh, in, in compiling these together. And I would say that what this protects against is the bite style of reading the Bible. Um, I probably still have uh, sections of scripture that I memorized that I have no idea how they fit into their context. I shouldn't say I have no idea. I've read the Bible through many, many, many times. So, um, but I don't know how they fit specifically into their context. Uh, and so for a long time, I know it's happened with many passages, I took it to be one way that was opposite of what it was actually intended to be because I didn't know what was happening. And, and we all know, right? Like you can make a bite say anything you want to, especially in our culture. We have this meme culture now. You can take someone and completely defame them and completely miss what they were saying by taking two or three words. I think I've seen so many videos in the last probably month or so where, where somebody's, uh, somebody cobbled together like all these words that someone said uh, separately to make them say something the opposite of what they mean, right? So we should not do that with scriptures. We should not uh, approach it from a bite style standpoint or a meme style standpoint or a bit standpoint. We should approach these. Uh, re we should remember the source, the style, the original setting, and remember that, that the scriptures are compilations of whole books and whole sections, not a whole pile of random bites. Okay? So first, re read it as divinely collected and inspired works of literature. Second, read it as story. I love this, and this is where uh, when you look at this mosaic, right, you see its unity in a progression, in a story that God is telling us about, about the way the world works. Um, the scriptures present something that we would call meta-narrative. Meta-narrative, uh, so, so many of the styles of scriptures, specific, in fact, the majority of scriptures, specifically its literary style or genre, is narrative. But there are other things that are in there as well. But when you back up, you see a great narrative from beginning to end. Is that my? That's not my alarm. <laughs> okay. You see a great narrative emerge. That's what we see in this mosaic as we take a look at it. This great narrative where God has a beginning. We have uh, players that come in and create conflict, right? There's promise that comes. That's why we summarize it with our six symbols here. Um, there's promise, there's movement towards a hero who's going to come and set things to right, and then there's a wrapping up, uh, or we should say a re restoration 
of, of all things. And so we have this grand narrative. And, and I, when I say meta-narrative, right, it, what we're saying is that Scripture, not every part of it is narrative, but the whole unified whole is giving a narrative that specifically is trying to say something about the nature of all of existence. A meta-narrative is a narrative that says this is the way everything works, right? Like it is, and it's a, it is a huge claim. Some people, in fact, uh, struggle with the whole idea of meta-narrative because there are many of them out there. And, and usually they are oppressive because they are saying everything is this way and therefore I can oppress these people or I can do this or that to force them into my story over here. So some people associate the idea of meta-narrative with the idea of oppression, inherent oppression, because there's somebody saying this is the way all of existence works and this is the point of all of history. So don't miss that the scriptures are making that strong claim. But unlike many others, their centers on the work of someone who is working for restoration and good. Okay, so, and since they are, since the scriptures are this type of story, a story claiming to interpret all of existence, the authority of scriptures is derived from its narrative character. Now, I, I have participated in deriving the authority of scriptures from a bit sort of approach where I've extracted something out and imposed it out on other things uh, and missed what, the, what, that, what, that, uh, what that bit of scripture was actually doing. So don't miss this. In, uh, in, in this view, in the meta-narrative view, meaning that the scriptures are claiming to interpret all of existence through this unified story, the authority of scripture comes from that narrative idea. And so when we look at it, it's more like the, the authority that a play has over its actors, or a playwright has over the actors in that play. Now, I won't completely unpack that, but I will say that in this view, we best understand the scriptures as redemptive history, because what they're presenting is everything being created good, and then the fall coming in to mess that up. Like this major enemy comes in and, 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 com and completely twists Shalom up. And so the rest of it is all about God moving back towards harmony and unity and everything being good as he declared it to be in the very beginning. And, it, and that, so you could call that the purpose of the scriptures. And it centers on the power of this hero who arrives in at the right time and is actually capable, being God and human together, actually capable of altering the course of history. Okay, so um, redemptive history is what kind of history this narrative is. Original scenario, so this is going to follow that. Original scenarios and behaviors are not always what are authoritative in our context. When you get a story uh, in the Old Testament, Sometimes there are things that are extremely messed up that the characters are involved in and are doing that are not about shalom. And they are not all meant to be descriptive, uh, or excuse me, prescriptive uh, behaviors that describe the way we should behave in our context. All right? But, okay, so I'm going to say that sentence again. Original scenarios and behaviors are not always what are authoritative in our context in light of this redemptive historical meta-narrative. But the character of God, his kingdom, and his mission of a restoration, especially as expressed in the story of the mission's hero, Jesus, transcends all cultures and contexts. And these are what is to be contextualized to today. And so as we immerse ourselves in God's story, as we immerse ourselves in this story over and over and over again, filling ourselves up with the scriptures, we ask God for help to be the sort of community that faithfully plays our part in this narrative. Okay? So while reading, we, we need to remember what sort of collections of book this is together as a story, what that means the narrative is trying to do, and therefore what it means to obey it. Okay? So the nature of authority comes from the idea of a narrative, a story claiming to interpret all of existence. 
And I might say just as an aside here um, that uh, I don't think until I began thinking along these lines of narrative that I really dealt very strongly with the fact that cultural culture is telling you, is, is, sh is shaping a narrative. Everyone lives by some dominant story or some dominant worldview. And we can either have it shaped by our culture or we can have it shaped by the story that God is telling us. And it, it can be subtle. It can be very subtle. Even as I was putting this together, I thought of it, it, probably at least four alternate stories that could come to mind. And they aren't all defined as stories necessarily. But the big ones that we normally think of are things like intentionally secular humanism or naturalism, right? Where people deny the existence of God and say that the point of, of all living is for us to, to just like be as good as we possibly can be and have a nice life until we die, right? Um, we interpret everything by what we can uh, observe empirically. And, and what, there's nothing beyond that. So we always think of that one, right? But there's others. I think there's another one that's, that's uh, less purely atheistic or agnostic. More, uh, you might say, like it's less blatantly against the idea of God and him controlling the story. And more kind of uh, floats in the realm of, well, maybe there's a God, but maybe he's not really paying that much attention to what's going on. And I think that that's the one that is fairly common in our culture, the one of personal prosperity and individualism, where you're supposed to live your life um, for your own happiness and, uh, and accumulate as much wealth as possible. And that one is very subtle. That one creeps its way into our Christian communities uh, and into our Christian way of thinking because we have been steeped in it. Like we've, we've really been completely immersed in that. Here's, an, here's a third one. Okay, so uh, even more subtle. I would call it religious or culturally Christian personal prosperity or individualism where we view even our Christianity as primarily about us and us individually getting he to heaven when we die and along the way um, uh, having as nice of a life as we possibly can, right? Um, and I'm kind of saying these in crude terms, so I'm, I'm characterizing these. They're very nuanced. Um, and then, of course, there's a fourth one, which is basically alter alter alternate religious fundamentalism, where it's, you know, a different, it's not, uh, it doesn't claim any sort of Christianity or anything like that. It might be the, the Islam story or, or something else, where, where it is also an interpretive way of looking at life. Okay, so these are out there. And we, as God's people, need to know that they're there, and we need to be a people who know that the scriptures are presenting a unifying story that we are to align our lives to. Okay? Um, so, third one. We'll move on to the third point. And I, th I think this one is so key. We are to read and live it the scriptures. Read and live the scriptures with a believing community. So these, these follow one another in progression, right? We read it as a divinely collected work of, works of literature, right? Comes from God through human means. We read it as story that we're, we're supposed to play our parts in, but then how do we play it? Well, we're, we're meant not to do this primarily individually. We're meant to do this with a believing community, being, and I like to use the term, people of the book. Being people of the book is primarily a community task, not a private one. And I think that that's where, when you look at how the scriptures were originally given to the original communities, uh, uh, they, it, it had to be a community affair. It, it, it was the only option. Um, and the, so the people who were originally writing it wrote it with that in mind. And God wrote it with that in mind, too. He meant for it to be something that was played out in the, in the context of a group of believers, like a people who are working out the implications of Scripture together. And where that, those alternate meta-narratives come in is that since we have been steeped in a personal prosperity individualism culture, it bleeds into our Christianity often uh, so that we find ourselves very much in the primarily individual Christian mentality that my goal is to be a good Christian for me, so I add on a believing community to help in, 
uh, enhance my Christianity, and I add on reading the Bible to help enhance my Christianity, and that's backwards. Like uh, it, uh, our individual selves are definitely a part, but you even look in, um, I love Colossians 1. You even look in Colossians, and it says that Jesus upholds everything by the word of his power. He rules over everything that exists. So it starts with him ruling over everything cosmic. And then it says, and he's head of the body of the, the church. Together, we are his people. And then it says, and you have been forgiven, right? Like even Paul is presenting this logical order of God rules over everything and he's called us together collectively to be his people. And he gave us these scriptures collectively together to be worked out in community, to be read, to be understood, to be examined, to be lived in community. And that also involves your individual ingestion of it or interaction with it, right? So don't get that backwards. This is, we are meant to be primarily a community of the people of God. You are not all lone rangers, okay? Um, and I would just say this is acknowledgedly uncomfortable. You know, I can go into, I can go into a corner of my house and I can get my coffee and I can put the light on uh, in a specific, like let the light filter in so I can see the dust motes. These are the things that like make me feel a certain way. Like there's an aesthetic, right? And then I get out my, my Bible and my journal and there's like the coffee steaming up next to it. I can snap a little picture to put on Instagram. You know what I mean? And I can read a little bit and get a glowy feeling. Okay, now look. I believe God created everything and he created our senses. Okay, so here's my caveat. I love all of that business, right? And you should too. But sometimes the spirit speaks loudly through a community working this out and it's uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable. And very often I have and I have seen others value whatever that glowy thing was that happened over here over as if it was authoritative over the working out of the difficult implications of the scripture in a community. And I can say that in that crucible, I believe that God has shown me so much more about himself because of you, you people in this room, because I, I, we, we, are, we are working hard to work this out together. That's why I put this picture up here, because this is, this is my missional community, you know? Our church is structured in a way around missional community because we, be, we believe that we aren't supposed to just read, love your neighbor, and feel nice about it. We're, we're supposed to like move into action for that, right? And um, this is, we were packing bags for severe weather shelter. I spent many nights overnight uh, with people who are experiencing homelessness in this shelter. And I, I can tell you, and... Tim's done it with me. He's in my missional community. And all of you have done this. It's not always fun, is it? Like, we don't get glowy feelings from this stuff. Like, the people who are vulnerable, uh, who are the least of these, are broken. And we realize that we are too as we encounter them, right? And we, we really need Jesus in these places. You can avoid that business by just staying in your corner and opening your, like shooting a picture of the Bible with Instagram. You can avoid this. But when you work in community, you're going to smell each other's armpits and smell each other's BO, and you're going to realize that you have the same. And it's not always comfortable. So, scriptures were meant to be read and lived out with a believing community. I can tell you, if all Jesus meant by uh, go and make disciples was to post pictures on Instagram of what you're doing individually, then all of the epistles wouldn't have been written because every single one of them was about a messed up group of people who were trying to obey this stuff. They were trying to live as if it was true. And Paul had to come in and say, okay, guys, let's not be that way. Let's remember what Jesus said. Okay, like he, he was running around writing these epistles because real people were actually trying to live it out, okay? So it's meant to be primarily a community affair. 
and it's uncomfortable, but we should prioritize community in the reading, examining, and working out of obedience to scriptures. Okay, so fourth, read all of it a lot. <laughs> um, read all of it a lot. Um, let me just say there's lots of grace from God. We, we start with, right, that we're a community of people who are forgiven. We have been made right with God because of Jesus. And that's why we're even near to him and can even meet him through scriptures or anywhere else. Right? So, so um, there are many that I have experienced, and maybe this is just me, okay? So I'm just going to say it. I, but I've experienced the uh, tyranny of thinking that there was only one right way to read the Bible. You had to use one specific version. You had to uh, do it for this many minutes every day. You had to uh, do it in this order. You had to pray a certain prayer before. Um, you couldn't use uh, that, that method or this method or the other method. And I'm just telling you guys, I don't think, I don't think the original authors intended any of that stuff. Um, when you think about the way these would have been given to the original communities who would have received them, it wasn't, it, it wasn't like that. And so when I say read all of it a lot, basically what I'm saying is get it in you in volume by whatever means you're able to. Um, I've, I, I've gone to nearly exclusively audio for my personal uh, ingestion of scriptures for several years now. Um, and I had people say before, well, that's not really reading the Bible. Well, then the first people who ever received it weren't reading it either because none of them had their pocket New Testaments, right? They all had to listen to somebody <laughs> reading it to them. Okay, so get it in you. Like, uh, I would say whatever it takes through good formats that can help you see that big mosaic for one and then also see the different parts of it. Whatever format is, is going to let you get there alongside of, 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 of this format of gathering around this book, gathering around God's story, just get it in you. Quantity and immersion over nitpicking. Uh, I will always say that because I can nitpick a tiny little part to death and miss everything else that is going on and completely miss what's happening. So when I say that, I'm not saying there's no place for nitpicking. I'm not saying that whatsoever. But what I am saying is that we want to get the overview over and over and over and over iteratively. Like you need to be through it all many, many times. Um, and what I find that happens is that when you read the whole and then come back to reading the parts and reading the whole and reading the parts, I like to talk about this thing called the spiral of learning because you take a pass at it and then you come back around and examine little bits and then you take another pass and you just continue to move closer and closer and closer to what it is that is it, what those human authors were intending as well as what God is intending in the grand scheme of things. Okay, so you read the whole, read the parts, read the whole, listen to it. I put it on double time through Leviticus, you know, in audio, because truly our brains can actually process audio a lot faster than we can talk. So, <laughs> and a lot of them are a bunch of names, all right, or laws, okay? So it's, that's, there's grace for that, but get through, like, get through it. You need to read Leviticus, you need to read Exodus. You need to see the grace of God through the way he gave himself in the Old Testament and then believe that when Jesus comes, he says, I'm that guy. He's not, not that guy in the Old Testament, right? So find the, uh, find, the, um, find the means that gets a lot of it in you and just tap on it. Uh, quantity. Um, and then... Uh, bring it back to this, this community thing. Here at Sola Church, the primary, the primary environment that we have for being immersed in the story of God and being reminded of who he is and what he's done in his scriptures is this gathering. And so I would encourage you to, uh, to prioritize the community ingestion of scriptures. All right, so that's number four. 
I have an analogy. I, I have some resources I want to give you. Um, and I also have an analogy that might help. I was just thinking about how to play the game of football well. Are there any football fans in here? OK, right. So I'll be honest, I'm not. So watch this analogy fall apart <laughs> as I give it to you. <laughs> but look, you can read the history of the game, right? Like if I want to play it well, if I want to get out there and play a sport well, I can read the history of the game. I can read about all of the things that brought the game about in the beginning and, and made it to be what it was then and then brought it from one iteration to the next and rules that were added at different times to contextualize for the, for the current times. Okay? I can also read the memoirs and biographies of great players. Did you know I actually read a, a, an autobiography of Dick Butkus? I have read that. So. Has anyone else here read the autobiography of any professional football player? <laughs> Who did? Somebody to raise their hand. <laughs> Jesse, you have? <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Football, man. <laughs> all right. So, uh, and man, I labored through that thing. I don't even know why I even read it. Um, <laughs> But you can read the autobiographies or biographies and memoirs of the players. You can read and be inspired by the words of previous coaches. Like don't, don't uh, 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 Vince Lombardi, don't we hear his name over and over again and see his quotes everywhere? There's memoirs and biographies. You can watch movies and documentary pieces about football. I've, I've uh, done many of those. Um, you can read books on the fundamentals of the game and the intricacies of the game. You can read playbooks. You can, you can do all of these things, right? And I think you should. I think if you were a student of football and you wanted to play the game well, you probably should do some of all of that. You can also work out, and you should do that. But you need to know what the game is all about the game itself. Like when you get on that field, you can't have just like uh, read some histories. You need to know which direction you're supposed to take the ball and who's going to try to stop you and who's going to try to help you, right? And you need to know how the scores work and who the refs are. Like you need to know what this game is all about from its beginning to its goal. And you really need, if you want to play the game well, you need to be coached. You need to practice, and you need to play the game with a real team. All right, so the analogy is going to fall apart somewhere. But what I'm saying is, let's let our experience of scriptures be all of that, all of those things. Let's read the history that we found in the scriptures. Let's read the memoirs and biographies of the great players. And man, Dick Butkus was a great player, but he had flaws. So do every great player in the Bible, except for one. You need to read and be inspired by the works of the previous people that are there. You, you need to immerse yourselves in the, in the different sorts of, uh, of literature that is there. Um, but you also need to practice and play. You need to practice and play the scriptures with God's team. All right? So here's a couple of resources for you. Commentaries. Do not just try to read commentaries. I think I said this before. All right? Uh, you will, you, I mean, unless you're that, that type, you may get bogged down in some intricacies that may actually divert you from what's actually going on. So commentaries are great supplemental things, but don't just try to read commentaries. All right? Uh, second, I found this, um, this resource probably single more for individual understanding of the scriptures and even in community I, I found this resource to probably be better than any other out there um, the bible project is fantastic specifically there's uh there's a couple of um there's a couple of videos out about the public reading of scripture about how to read the bible there's ones about literary style and then what i've looked is i use the uversion program uh the app um to read and you can download the, uh, or get the, um, the Bible Project plan, which has all the introductions to the books, as well as overviews about the grand story. And it, it keeps coming back to it over and over and over again. 
So it'll give you like some of that cultural context and historical background and literary styles along the way as you're, as you're going. This stuff's fantastic. And you can still turn it on double time. <laughs> uh, so a um, couple others, uh, how to read a book. This is not even specifically about reading the Bible, but a lot more of the reading the Bible is, is based off of normal communication rules than what you would think. Um, so how to read a book. The Classic Guide to Intelligent Reading is actually really great. Uh, there's another book called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. It dives in, oh, I guess I missed that one. Um, the, there it is. How to Read the Bible for All It's work, Worth. It, it dives into a lot of the, the literary and genre related issues and keeps, uh, keeps linking it back to the grand story. The drama of scripture is meant to emphasize the grand story and he has some, uh, some statements about the authority of scripture that I think are, are gold and, uh, and coming from uh, many other, uh, th the backing of many other theologians along the way as well. And then, um, and then finally I would just say, oh, and, and then one more book, Saving the Bible from Ourselves. This one's really good too about, uh, um, about well, it says learning to read and live the Bible well. It points out a lot of the issues that maybe traditionally we've run into when reading the Bible that have contributed to us reading and understanding it poorly um, in a better way. Uh, I think I would, I would finally say, just to end here, um, there's, yeah, gather with the community, be with the community, learn with the community, live it out with the community, ask the hard questions with the community. Um, Pippi, I've just put up the picture of when you were baptized. This is probably by far my favorite memory of any of our gatherings. When we gathered around and just celebrated and rejoiced um, because of who God is and what he was doing. And we together, like that was uh, something that Pippi was doing individually, but that all of us together as a community participated in and were reminded of the story that we're a part of. Um, so again, I can't emphasize enough, lean into community, not erasing the individual sense of ingesting scripture, but understanding, um, understanding that working out the implications of scripture have, uh, have to be done in community. Okay, in God's community. Do life with a believing community. Um, so, uh, probably just finally, as we wrap up here today, I would say to end with, if you're, ever, if you're confused, like here's where the grace always comes in. Read about Jesus. Look at Jesus. Know who Jesus is. That's why I read those passages at the beginning. Hebrews 1 especially. The scriptures say about the scriptures that Jesus is the truest expression of God. He, when we look at Jesus and we're confused about other things that are going on both in our world, the alternate narratives that we're seeing, as well as confused about what we might be reading in the scriptures, when you look at Jesus, you're always, I'm almost always brought into laser focus. Um, there's not... Uh, what he says and what he does went together seamlessly. And when he called his people to live in his ways, he didn't do so dis, uh, disjointedly, like saying, go do that thing I told you to do. He said, look at my example. Look what I've done to reconcile you to, the, to God. Like you, you're not doing any of these things as religious activity, quote unquote, meant to perform for God or prove yourself to God or prove yourself as pious. You are doing these because the true relational God who is in charge of everything has reconciled you to him and is now wanting you to participate with him as he restores all things, right? So he's, he reorients us around who God is and what he's done both by giving us life through his death, burial, and resurrection but then also, as he left, he said, I'm with you always to the end. He doesn't abandon us, right? So even in trying to figure out what to do with scriptures, look at Jesus, ask him to help. Lean into community who also asks him to help uh, and, and, and rely on that. And that's really why we do this other thing, right? 
Um, I put up the picture of baptism. That's one of those things that Jesus commanded us to do. I mean, when you think about it, what were the things that he actually commanded in terms of rituals? What are the things he actually commanded to do? And there's not a whole lot of them. Baptism was one of them, which we get to participate in community together to be reminded what story we're a part of. And this one is as well, communion together. Because every time we do this, we remember his death and his resurrection until he comes back to be with us. And we get re-centered and recalibrated around the story that we're actually part of, which is why he's given us his scriptures anyway. Okay, so um, we're going to say our call to communion together, and then uh, we'll take this together.